Hey, welcome back. We are continuing to talk through an AP Physics C mechanics course and think through how to do different problems. And so this is practice from an FRQ in 2018. I got this information straight from AP Central College Board's website. And so let's go ahead and give it a shot, practice and, and learn some physics along the way. So and so what happens is you have a solid sphere. It's held vertically a distance h above a pad by an electromagnet shown in the figure above. Experimental equipment is designed to release a sphere when the electromagnet is turned off. A timer also starts when the electromagnet is turned off. And the timer stops when the sphere lands on the pad. A. While taking the first data point, the student notices that the electromagnet actually releases the sphere after the timer begins. Would the value of g calculated from this one measurement be greater than, less than, or equal to the actual value of g at this new location? Justify your answer. All right, so think about this for a second. What this means is the sphere actually hits the pad before we record it hits the pad. So our time is going to be greater than it actually should be. And so you can reason through in a couple different ways that your acceleration that you calculate for this, the g value, is actually going to be less than what it actually should be. In other words, the real world g value is going to be greater than what we calculate here. There are a couple ways. One way is just to reason through that with words conceptually. Let me show you a better way, though, to justify why that is the case. And so this is just the part A rewritten here. So let's go through and start with a kinematics equation that's straight from your equation sheet and start modifying it for what we have in this situation. First of all, let's go ahead and make this into the y-axis. And so if we do that, our initial position is going to be zero and our initial velocity is zero because it's dropped. So those two terms go away. And we're going to change this y into an h because they use h right here. So we're going to do that and we come up with h is equal to one half gt squared. But we're really interested in g. So let's isolate for g and see what happens. It turns out that g is equal to 2h over t squared. And if we say that's the case, if t goes up because our device is faulty somehow and our t value is greater than it should be, then therefore g will go down. And so that's essentially how you can argue that the calculated g value is going to be less than the actual value of g. So that's how you would approach part a. Let's continue. Okay, and then the problem says the electromagnet is replaced, so the timer begins when the sphere is released. So they've taken care of the problem that they mentioned before. The student varies the distance h. The student measures and records the time, delta t of the fall for each particular height, resulting in the following data table. So they give you a data table here that you can fill out the rest of the data. And it says for b, indicate below which quantity should be graphed to yield a straight line whose slope could be used to calculate a numerical value for g. So let's think about this. We're looking at slope. We want to know what the slope is going to be. And we want to know what we're going to do in the vertical and the horizontal axis here. So remember, rise over run is what we mean by slope here when we're calculating this. And we did do some work on the last screen. Oh, by the way, down below, it does say use the remaining rows in the table above to record any quantities that you indicated that are not given in the table. Label each row so you can use and include units. All right, fair enough. So first of all, we have to decide what's in our rise and what's in our run, so to speak. What's in our delta y and what's in our delta x. Delta x is clearly going to be t squared. And in the vertical axis, we're going to use h or 2h. It actually makes sense based on what we have done before. To call it a 2h, we could use h initially and then modify it. And in fact, that's not the better way of doing things, but that is the way that the College Board has chosen to write this up. So I'll show you how we get there. But first of all, we do want to plug in some numbers. So we're going to go ahead and plug in 2h values. And we'll plug in t squared values over here. And that's how we're going to fill this out. Based on that, we're going to make our graph. And so let's go ahead and make our graph. It says plot the data points for the quantities indicated in part B on the graph below. Clearly scale and label all axes, including units as appropriate. Draw a straight line that best represents the data. All right, so let's take a look at this. First of all, t squared is no problem. You go ahead and graph the t squared and you do it proportionally on the bottom. Here what I did is I graphed h and looking back on it that was a mistake. I did that because the college board graphed h and it's fine. You can get the right answer with this. It's just not as easy to follow how to do a conversion at the end. I'll show you what I mean. It makes more sense to graph 2h in my opinion. All right so we'll continue. 
we'll follow what the College Board has done and I'll explain. It'll hopefully make sense in terms of the conversion that we're going to use to be able to get our final answer. So I just went ahead, I drew my best fit line. Now it's really important that you use a straight edge here. Don't sketch that line. Use a straight edge to be able to draw that. It's actually worth a point on this test that you use a straight edge. And you can expect to have a graph like this where you do end up graphing something. So it will be worthwhile to have a ruler with you to be able to do this. And then really important too that you're going to calculate your slope based on points from your best fit line. This point here and this point here would make good points that are found at crosshairs on your graph. Really important that you do not use these blue dots right here. In other words, do not use data that's given to you as your calculation for your best fit line graph. You actually want to use points on the line, not individual data points. The justification for that, by the way, is because we're much more confident with our answers from our line of best fit in general than we are confident about individual data points on our graph. So if we do that calculation based on data points that I found here and I found over here, it turns out that our slope is going to be 4.75. But really the slope I've calculated here is 1 half G because we're only dealing with 1 H, not 2. So we have to multiply that slope by 2 to be able to come up with our final answer. So our final answer based on the line of best fit and then multiplying that by two is gonna be 9.5 meters per second squared. So that's our calculated value for G, you could say, based on our data. So this next part says another student fits the data in the table into a quadratic equation. Student's equation for the distance fallen Y as a function of time is Y equals A T squared plus B T plus C, where A, B, and C are given to you. Vertically down is the positive direction. Using the student's equation above, do the following. Derive an expression for the velocity of the sphere as a function of time. Fair enough. All right, so they gave us a function that shows position with respect to time, and we need the velocity with respect to time. So hopefully this is going to be pretty straightforward for you. All you're going to do is take the derivative of that equation. So there are a couple different ways of doing this. We can do this generally speaking. Or we can go ahead and plug in specific values for A, B, and C. I went ahead and did these specific values for A, B, and C and took the derivative of that. So dy dt is your velocity with respect to time. And so we end up with this equation here for a velocity with respect to time. And then part two of E just says calculate the new experimental value for G. All right, so we're talking about an acceleration here. And if we look at this equation right here, there are multiple ways to do this, but by far the easiest one is just to take a second derivative of what we worked with already, or a derivative of our velocity with respect to time, you could say. And if we do that, we just say our acceleration with respect to time is going to be 11.5 meters per second squared. So that's our answer for E2 or EII. Pretty straightforward stuff. All right, and it says using the student's equation above, do the following using 9.81 as the accepted value for G at this location, calculate the percent error for the volume of G found in EII or E2. All right, so it turns out this equation is not in your equation sheet, but hopefully over the course of doing enough physics and other science courses, you've done percent error often enough that you basically understand what this is going to be. If you don't, if you don't have this memorized, you should memorize this equation. So it's going to be percent error is your experimental minus your accepted divided by your accepted. You're going to take the absolute value of that and multiply it by 100% and come out with an answer in percent. If you do that here, it turns out that you end up with 17.2% error. And then part four or IV, you're gonna say, assuming the sphere is at a height of 1.4 meters at time equals zero, calculate the velocity of the sphere just before it strikes the pad. All right, so we're solving for some V at a certain height of 1.4 meters. And so part of how they're gonna want you to do this problem is to think back what they had originally given you for your equation for this and to be able to realize that this is going to be your initial velocity that's your b coefficients if you're not sure about that if you're like hey how do you justify that how do you know that well if you take a look at this you can see that acceleration would have units of meters per second squared and that's what you would have to have right here if you multiply by time squared to end up with meters over here so this must be an acceleration over here you've got meters per second you multiply it by your time function over here in seconds and you would end up with an answer in meters so 
If you're not sure about something, look at the units. The units are going to be your clue as to what you're working with. And you can go ahead and use the quadratic here and come up with your time is equal to 0.527 seconds. If you don't want to use the quadratic, first of all, you can use that with a solver, uh, a calculator on your test, and that'll be fine. If you don't want to do that, then there are different ways to go about doing this. So you can solve this equation even using conservation of energy if you want, but you can go ahead and use the quadratic here. Another way of doing this would be to solve for an unknown, another unknown in your equation using kinematics and then solve for time and get your final velocity. That would be avoiding quadratic. If you want to avoid the quadratic, in other words, and take an extra step, you can do that. And once we have the time, then this becomes easy because you have your previous work where you solve for the velocity function over here. We go ahead and plug in our time right here and we end up with an answer of 5.54 meters a second. So hopefully this helps. Hopefully you can look at this and go, oh yeah, I can do this. Hopefully your confidence is building and if you do enough practice over time, you can do this. You can answer these questions, you can pass the test. And so we're going to continue with some other practice problems.